Longtime listeners of the podcast know that we never miss an episode. In fact, until now, we hadn't missed a single episode in 15 years. So it was not an easy decision for us to suspend new recordings of the podcast during the COVID-19 crisis. On the bright side, this is an opportunity for us to revisit some of our favorite episodes from the archives. Some of my personal favorites are with authors whose work I've been enjoying as a reader for years. This episode, which dropped on August 12th, 2016, features two such writers, Colson Whitehead talking about the Underground Railroad and Jeffrey Tubin talking about American Heiress, his book about Patty Hearst. Both authors I'd interviewed before. In fact, that year, I interviewed Colson on three separate occasions about the Underground Railroad, once memorably at the Sydney Book Festival. But this episode was recorded in our studio at the Times headquarters in Manhattan. Colson Whitehead's new novel, The Underground Railroad, is already making a mark as a work of fiction that combines history and metaphor, telling a story about slavery in America in new and surprising ways. Whitehead is the author of many books, including Zone One and Sag Harbor, and he's also received a MacArthur Genius Grant and many other awards. Colson, thanks so much for being here. Sure, my pleasure. So this is not your first novel, obviously, but how many novels have you written? And your, uh, your last book is about poker. This is my sixth, and I have two nonfiction, and the last nonfiction was about uh, playing in the World Series of Poker and having to you know, bone up on the game and, and train for a couple of weeks and crash course in order to play at the annual big game. That was the Noble Hustle? Noble Hustle, yeah. So how did you get from the Noble Hustle to the Underground Railroad? I'm always sick of like whatever style I was working in when I'm done with the book. And that last book was first person, a lot of jokes. You know, I saw it as a humor book and I just tried to cram as many you know, weird jokes in as, as I could. Uh, with the Underground Railroad, well, it's fiction. I tried to have a lot of humor, humor in my books, but obviously you can't really have as many jokes per page. I, f- I found one a- <laughs> joke so far. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in a book about slavery, so that, so that was good. My last couple of novels I've had, uh, it's kind of black dudes walking around thinking about things, and it seemed um, have a female protagonist and mix it up, and I never explored a mother-daughter relationship before, so it seemed um, good for me to break out of sort of a mode I'd been in. Did part of the idea of this sort of scare you to write in the voice of a woman, for example? Um, not so much her. I mean, I think uh, that's your job. I mean, it's nice when people say, oh, you really got a female character's voice, and I just think, well... That's what you signed up on when you picked the book and it said it's a female character. Like if you have a plumber and he unclogs your drain, you don't go, wow, you really unclogged that drain. That's why you called him and um, that's why he did it. So uh, it was hard just to tackle slavery and, and get into the research and really contemplate and immerse myself in, in the horror. You know, I hadn't, I don't think people walk around thinking about slavery in a deep way all the time in their right. daily lives. Um, obviously, exposed to roots when I was very young and studied it in college, but I hadn't immersed myself in um, slave narratives and, or slave histories in a very long time. And now that I'm older, you know, it affects me more than it did when I was a teenager or in my early 20s. And so um, realizing how much of the true horrors I was, was going to have to submit my protagonist and her companions to was daunting and terrifying. It also seems that, I mean, we're roughly the same age, that depictions of slavery, obviously there was Roots and there was uh, Beloved, but in the last decade or so have almost re-examined it and in a way that's a lot more fearless and visceral and um, that your book kind of fits in well with that. Um, well, I think, um, you know, I'm taking liberties with the historical record. I mean, I'm playing with time once Cora gets deep into her journey. But that first section when she's in Georgia, I want to be as realistic as, I, you know, I could make it, which means a lot of brutality. And it means impressing upon the reader the psychological tortures that they were um, forced to endure. So for those who have not yet read the book, let's just talk a little bit about the the storyline. Um, we start off, as you mentioned, in Georgia with Cora. Cora is a 16 or 17-year-old girl. Um, owners didn't keep track of their slaves' birthdays, so she has no idea how old she is. Her family is gone. Her mother has run off years before, and she's a, an orphan, a stray on the plantation. A man named Caesar is sold down south uh, from the north. He has contacts in the Underground Railroad, so they light out to the north availing themselves of his contacts. And that's when the book changes. Um, I guess I had this idea that, you know, what if the Underground Railroad was an actual literal railroad 
which is a premise, not so much of a, a full story. Was that the first, like one of the first things that you came up upon when you were? Yeah, it was about 16 years ago. And I was thinking, oh, isn't it funny? Like when you were a kid and you first hear about it and you think it's a literal subway. And I was like, what if it was? New York City <laughs> kid <laughs> thinks it's a literal subway. <laughs> well, actually on, on Twitter, you know, I'll, I'll search for the, uh, for the title of the book and there'll be, you know, teenagers uh, in school, like, oh, Missy's so stupid. She thinks of the Underground Railroad is literal. <laughs> and there's always like a couple of those a day. And so I think it's a common um, fantasy. So that was just the, you know, the fanciful notion. And then uh, I was thinking how to make that into a story. And I was like, what if every state, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, she goes through is a different state of American possibility. And so I was thinking about how each state could have a different character. And the first place she ends up is South Carolina, which is a seemingly benevolent, paternalistic place where they have a lot of programs for black social uplift, jobs programs, housing. North Carolina is a white supremacist state where black people are outlawed and um, not allowed to step over the state line. And so I was trying to sort of tweak American history to expose various tensions and I mean, did you sort of create certain rules for yourself? Like, well, this is going to be, this part will sort of maintain a kind of historical accuracy and integrity, and I will place these sort of discrete what could have been or what might have been or what was, but not then and not there within that? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, Georgia, where we meet her on the plantation, I knew it was going to be very realistic and a traditional depiction of a plantation life. And then the first time she gets out of the, out of the Underground Railroad, she looks up and sees a skyscraper. And that's, uh, as a writer, that's why I'm sort of going to let it rip and have fun and <laughs> go crazy and upend the reader's notions. And it's, a, you know, obviously a big sign to the reader that we're, we're not, not in Kansas, Kansas anymore. anymore. <laughs> and then I think, you know, I, I thought of the book 16 years ago. And initially, and for many years, each state took place in a very different time frame. And so South Carolina would have been like in this very stylized future place with with gene experiments and, and slaves bred for different roles. And it would have been, and the fantastic gestures would have been much more broad and a sort of cloud atlas, you know, type style. And so you're in a different world. And then the North Carolina chapter was going to be in this um, sort of 50s suburbia, um, very conformist sort of Eisenhower era America. That was the default for many years of the voice of the book and the structure. And then I just reread, and it's mentioned in the review, I was really glad to see it, 100 Years of Solitude, which I read when I was in high school and had a big impact on me. And I read it a few months before I started writing this book. And it just seemed, what if I just toned it down and didn't have to have these broad gestures that were sort of my default setting? There's a, a section in the book where she's a living exhibit in a museum and she acts out scenes from a plantation and a slave ship behind glass for the museum's patrons. And I feel like five years ago, there would have been a 10-page, like, huge, like, set piece. And now it's just, like, two pages. But it's interesting because I think just in the paper today, there was a photo from one of these museums where, you know, it wasn't the Museum of Living Wonders, but place where they, you know, reenact an earlier incarnation of America. And, you know, and there were two African-American people dressed up in costumes. Yeah, no, it was common. I mean, the first World's Fairs, you know, often had, you know, jungle natives in garb uh, dancing around to fit some, some, uh, some sort of idea of darkest Africa. Um, there are various um, African pygmies who were, you know, paraded uh, for the delectation of uh, American audiences. You know, once I, I decided not to make a historical novel and, and play with time, I was allowed to bring in things like that, which didn't occur in 1850, but were part of America in the late 19th century. And there are various things about eugenics and um, the Holocaust, which I bring in, and that's not really 1850, but they rang true. And so I think another rule besides concision was um, stick to the truth and not the facts. And so hmm. um, there seemed to be a truth in that museum section and where Cora finds herself in North Carolina that I wanted to be um, loyal to, even if it didn't actually happen. The Underground Railroad, to my mind, and now correct me if I'm reading this wrong, but is obviously serves as a metaphor on many different levels, one to kind of the possibility and ingenuity and potential that was there, but also in all the underground paths, some of which have become dead ends and some of which you are sort of closed off, are all of the possibilities of what might have been historically. 
Is that how you thought of it when writing it? Or Yeah, I mean, alternative states of America. And so a lot of towns in Oregon were founded on white supremacist principles. You know, come here, white people, and we can be away from like the, the black scourge. What if that white supremacist idea survived and, and kept on? And so that's sort of part of the idea for North Carolina. And then if you think about that, then it becomes tied to Nazi Germany and genocidal impulses. When Cora is trapped in an attic for a while in North Carolina, and that's based on a, a slave narrative by Harriet Jacobs, who supposedly spent seven years in her grandmother's attic after she fled her master who had sexual designs on her. Um, and that echoes Anne Frank. So how can I um, have these different uh, historical eras bump against each other, comment on each other uh, through Cora's story? Another thing that I that I find so interesting that I imagine is deliberate is that it seems that in each of these places, you're showing a different facet of racism. Um, so you mentioned the kind of benevolent, but ultimately controlling manipulative racism um, in the South Carolina, uh, and then the sort of blatant white supremacy in the North Carolina chapter. And then each one, you're sort of looking at a different a different kind of racism to sort of point out to the reader all the many forms. Yes, fortunately for, for me, as a writer, there are many different kinds of forms. Unfortunately for me, as a black person in America, there are many different kinds of forms of racism. Um, and so, you know, part of rebooting the book every 60 pages as she goes into a new state, I'm allowed to explore these different facets and have a different world that Cora is stuck in. Was it hard to be in this world? creatively, you know, for I don't I don't know how long you worked on it, but every day to be thinking about this? Um, before I started writing, when I, you know, had the characters, I knew who Cora was and what I'd have to do to her and her friends. Yeah, I mean, I felt terrified. And the more research I did, I was like, well, she's going to endure a lot of abuse before she hits the road. Um, it's just a fact of being a um, 14-year-old on a plantation. So that was depressing and horrible. And then, you know, I thought of my nameless ancestors, you know, I, I don't, after 100 years, the record of my family sort of dies out. So what did they, where, what state were they in and what kind of place were they? How did they come here? Once I got into the writing of it, I had that sort of distance to shape the material, to, you know, to sort of the story. At the end of the day, I could knock off and not uh, dwell upon it. I think there's a, a strange moment when I'd, I'd avoided seeing 12 Years a Slave because I was working on the same kind of thing. And and after I got 100 pages in, I was like, oh, I'll just I'll watch it. I feel fine. I, I know what my book is. I'm not going to be tainted. And um, I couldn't get through it. You know, even though I was putting my characters in the same situation, to actually see on the screen faces, you know, actors, but human faces go through what I was putting down the page was too awful. And I only made it halfway through the movie before I had to turn it off. I find it very interesting, the idea of sort of what do you read and watch? What do you absorb creatively while creating something else? Yeah, it depends where, you know, sometimes I've not wanted to uh, read anything that relates to my book. Sometimes I uh, I don't care. I had an idea to reread uh, Beloved and The Known World and Middle Passage. And I got 40 pages into Beloved and I was like, I'm totally screwed. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way. Like, I'm not going to learn anything. It's going to get me more depressed. So you put uh, it down? I put, I put it down. <laughs> have you yeah. picked it up again? <laughs> I, I've not, but um, I would like to. I mean, it is just you know, such an incredible book. But it was not useful for me as someone who's going to write about slavery to you know, read The Master. So, um, but you'd read it before. I read it before in, in college, yeah. When you were thinking about your character and, and Cora, she's very much a real character. And you meet her and you get a sense of her in that realistic, historical, early part of the book. And then you're putting in her into these somewhat sort of fantastical situations or quote-unquote unrealistic like how did you think about character development because you're taking her to other places that she wouldn't ordinarily have. yeah all, all the strange situations i mean each new america that they meet at every stop has to be encountered with like a, a straight face and can't, it's not uh there's no bewilderment they just accept it and so that matter of fact rule I think was set in you know, pretty early. I thought one of the most interesting early changes, I don't think I'm re revealing too much for people who haven't read it, in Cora's character is in South Carolina, where um, she started off with this kind of benevolent uh, treatment. She's sort of startled and grateful and pleased to have white people shake her hand and greet her respectfully. And then she's put in the museum as an exhibit. And she sees... One of the children who she used to um, 
care for uh-huh. and very deliberately tries to upset the child. As a slave, you're an object and have zero agency and no control of your body, your life, even what you eat or when you get up, when you go to sleep. And so she learns to read in South Carolina, and that's a powerful moment for freed slaves in all the narratives, like when you can finally get your mastery over the uh, the written word. And she becomes, you know, um, bit by bit, you know, powerful in her own way. And the museum has three different rooms for the black exhibit, the scenes from a slave ship, jungle, and, and plantation. And, you know, there's a problem of how do you get this uneducated character into contact with these different sort of concepts I want to explore. And so the museum section is a, a quick way to get her acquainted with what, her, what are her ideas of where she came from, what are her ideas of what happened on the ships that brought her family here, what are her ideas now about plantation life now that she's been out. You're presenting pitfalls and moments of suspense for your characters and reversals and also trying to present opportunities for her to grow. And so she's becoming a you know, more and more powerful person with every chapter, hopefully. You also do these like very interesting kind of um, constant sort of playing with uh, perspective. People talk about, you know, the history of slavery having been written largely by white people. And um, when you flip it, uh, what do you see that you didn't see before? And there's this passage that um, I was reading earlier that really struck me where um, someone who's hiding her in North Carolina, a white person, uh, Martin, is sort of apologizing for having to keep her hidden. Uh And he says, um, speaking about his wife, who is uh, particularly terrified, he says, you understand she's scared to death. We're at the mercy of fate. And Cora says, you feel like a slave? And he says, well, my wife hasn't chosen this life. And she repeats, you were born to it like a slave? Uh, I think a lot of times we're not aware of where other people are coming from. Cora would never have the power within herself to address a white person like that 100 pages earlier in the book. I mean, for me, that's an important moment. I'd love for you to read aloud um, from the Underground Railroad. Certainly. So describing the different rooms in the museum. The soothing blue walls of life on a slave ship evoked the Atlantic sky. Here, Cora stalked a section of the ship's deck around the mast, various small barrels and coils of rope. Her African costume was a colorful wrap. Her sailor's outfit, however, made her look like a street rascal with a tunic, trousers, and leather boots. The story of the African boy went that, after he came aboard, he helped out on deck with various small tasks, a kind of apprentice, Cora tucked her hair under the red cap. A statue of a sailor leaned against the gunwale. Spyglass pointed. The eyes, mouth, and skin color were painted on its wax head in disturbing hues. Typical day on the plantation allowed her to sit at a spinning wheel and rest her feet, the seat as sure as her old block of sugar maple back in the plantation. Chickens stuffed with sawdust pecked at the ground. From time to time, Cora tossed imaginary seed at them. She had numerous suspicions about the accuracy of the African and ship scenes, but was an authority in this room. She shared her critique with the curator. Mr. Fields did concede that the spinning wheels were not often used outdoors, at the foot of a slave's cabin, but countered while authenticity was their watchword, the dimensions of the room forced certain concessions. Would that he could fit an entire field of cotton in the display case and have the budget for a dozen actors to work it. One day, perhaps. And that's Colson Whitehead reading aloud a passage from his novel, The Underground Railroad, a scene in the Museum of Natural Wonders in South Carolina. Is there one thing that you wanted above all to accomplish in this book? Well, on the one hand, you know, I've been asked, like, uh, are you trying to educate people about a hidden corner of American history? Like, no, I'm not here to educate you. However, in wrestling with genocide, slavery, eugenics, I found how easy it was to find parallels between the slave experience and various moments in the 20th century and contemporary moments. And so if in reading the book, the reader can recognize that not a lot of things have changed in the, in the last 150 years, I think I'd be sort of happy. I think you will have readers thinking exactly that and many other things. Colson Whitehead, thank you so much. Thank you. The book, again, is The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead, and it's reviewed on our cover this week.
It's hot and disgusting out, so let's talk about summer reading. John Williams joins us now. Hey, Pamela. How are you? I'm good. Uh, I mean, you know, it's hot and disgusting, but otherwise it's fine. With the humidity hovering around 300%, it seems appropriate that we're talking about summer reading, and we have been for most of the season, actually, with our readers. We've been asking you we'll to send in. We'll just keep talking about it until the fall. <laughs> we have a few more weeks. So we've been asking you to send in voice memos to describe in 30 seconds or less a memorable summer experience you had reading a book, uh, either now or many years ago, and that had an impact on you. So we have a few more to listen to this week. Let's hear them. Hey, Mike Bernardi from Boston. My summer reading story happened 36 years ago down on Cape Cod. I was in between my freshman and sophomore years of college and picked up a Stephen King novel, The Stand. I had never, ever read a book for pleasure. Boy, was I hooked, hooked to pleasure reading, hooked to a few of Stephen King's novels, and also hooked to the idea or the fantasy of what the world would be like with just a few people left in it. And I was one of them. Thank you. Oh, my God. I totally remember reading The Stand and feeling so proud of myself, like such a grown up, because I had read a book that was just like bigger than me. How old were you? (laughs) I think I was like, I don't know, maybe 13. I think that book is still bigger than us. I have a copy of it at home. I haven't I haven't read it yet, but it's you're, very You're thick. still scared to open it up. A little bit. It's really good. And what's amazing about it, too, is that, you know, it's kind of a classic of the genre now. Mm-hmm. So many uh, dystopian or post-apocalyptic novels, you know, it's, you're like, this all started with The Stand, you know. And it's probably the one you still should read first. Yes. Let's listen to another reader. In the summer of 2005, I had just gotten back home to Sweden after spending a year in Spain. And I had brought a book back with me called Tomorrow in the Battle, Think of Me, by the Spanish author Javier Marias, then unknown to me. I started reading it, and it made a huge impression on me. The narrator has an affair with a married woman, and on the first night they spend together, she dies in his arms, and it just takes off from there into a story about guilt. And I remember thinking to myself while reading it, remember this book, because this is what storytelling is. This is what literature is. I have goosebumps. I want to read that. I know. I looked it up immediately after hearing that one. And as if, you know, the last thing I need is more book recommendations. Edward St. Aubin reviewed his last novel for us on the cover uh, a couple of years ago. And and he has a new book coming out this fall. I haven't read him at all, but he has, If I'm almost afraid to because he has so many books that if I love one of them, I feel like I'm devoting You're a lot of time. You're going down the rabbit hole. I am. All right. Let's I think we have one more, more this week. My name is Lori Hildebrandt. I live in Woodland, California. When I was oh, 8 to 11 years old, I'd ride my bicycle to Buckham Memorial Library. I'd be all hot and sweaty, but I'd step into the cool air inside the thick sandstone walls where the floors were cold marble and the windows were diamond-shaped leaded glass. I read every horse story in the children's section. Margarito Henry's Black Gold still stands out as the story of a thoroughbred racehorse that broke his leg during the Kentucky Derby. But Black Gold won that race on three legs and a heart. Girls and horse books. We all go through that stage. <laughs> I thought the first time I heard, I heard it that she said horror books, but then I realized that she said horse books. But it was kind of horror that the horse <laughs> broke its leg. All right. I would love for people to keep sending these in. They're so great. John, how do they do it? We want to keep hearing from you. Um, again, 30 seconds or less, and you can send it as a voice memo on your iPhone. If you don't know how to do that, we have an article for you at nytimes.com slash books that explains it. And you can email those voice memos to podcasts at nytimes.com. Thanks, John. Thanks, Pamela. Everyone knows that famous picture from the 70s of publishing heiress Patty Hearst, the one where she's posed with a knitted cap, army shirt, and machine gun in front of the flag of her captors, the Symbionese Liberation Army. Jeffrey Tubin has written many books about the law and other famous cases, including OJ, and he's a staff writer for The New Yorker and a senior legal analyst at CNN. Jeff, thank you for being here. All right. So this is a story that I feel like we all think we know well, or at least we have that, you know, iconic photo of Patty Hearst with the gun, uh, which you have on your cover in our head. But 
the details have become fuzzy. So tell us about the story of Patty Hearst. Well, in a nutshell, um, Patty Hearst was the granddaughter of William Randolph Hearst, though he died before she was born. And uh, in the 1970s, the Hearst name and newspapers generally uh, had a greater resonance of power and wealth than, alas, than they do today. Um, so she was a very famous family, although she was not famous. And on February 4th, 1974, uh, she was kidnapped by— How old was she? She was just about to turn 20, so she was still a teenager. She was mm-hmm. just 19 years old. And um, she was kidnapped by a ragtag almost— elevates their significance. I mean, a very small, crazy group called the Symbionese Liberation Army. She was kidnapped on February 4th, uh, and within two months, she had announced that she had joined the SLA, and her new name was Tanya. On April 15th, she um, participated in a bank robbery in San Francisco. The following month, six of the eight kidnappers were killed in an enormous shootout with the Los Angeles Police Department. And for the next year almost a year and a half, Patty was on the run with um, the the remnants of her group. She was eventually arrested in September of 1975, charged, convicted of bank robbery for her original bank robbery, Um, later had her sentence commuted by Jimmy Carter. She was later pardoned by President Clinton, and she's now a living sort of the life of a wealthy dowager in the New York suburbs. All righty. <laughs> there's a, that, <laughs> Let's there's a go lot ba- packed into that yes. uh, summary, but the book explains it all. Let's go back to she's 19 years old. She's living in Berkeley and she's kidnapped. And so Correct. How does that happen? She's um, living with her uh, boyfriend, fiance, Stephen Weed, and three members of the SLA – Uh, led by Donald DeFries, who was the leader who called himself General Field Marshal Sin-Q. They broke into this very quiet apartment on a quiet street in Berkeley, grabbed Patty Hearst, Stephen Weed, to his ultimate shame, sort of ran away. Um, (laughs) They stuffed Patricia in in the trunk of a car and wound up driving across uh, San Francisco Bay to Daly City. Patty was placed in a closet where she was held captive, and the SLA tried to figure out what to do with her and even what to ask for in ransom because they hadn't really even figured that out. And one of the things that strikes us now, I think, looking back at, at this, and there was this other great book by Brendan Kerner, The Skies Belong to Us, about uh, Can the- I tell you something? I loved that book so much. That book was so weird and funny yes. and strange. And again, an example of how insane the 70s were. That, to me, was one of the real revelations in writing this book. You know, I was alive during the 70s, but I was a kid. The 70s were nuts. Yes. <laughs> and, um, and and Brendan Kerner's book um, was really one of the inspirations for me wanting to go back to that period. Oh, that's because that was my next question. You know, how did you get to this subject? The specific route was very clear. Uh, I wrote a piece for The New Yorker in about three years ago about this gang in Baltimore that took over the local jail. The gang was called the Black Gorilla Family. I got interested in the history of the Black Gorilla Family, which was founded by George Jackson, the famous prisoner in Soledad Prison in the early 70s. And it turns out that the the 70s were a tremendous time of pr- activism in prisons. That the, 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 There had been the Attica riots in New York, but in California in particular, there was a lot of activism for and by prisoners. The Symbionese Liberation Army came out of that prison activism. And so it was actually my editor, Bill Thomas, when I was sort of boring him about California prisons, he said, well, <laughs> well but, but what about Patty Hearst? And I said to Bill, well, there must be a million books about Patty Hearst. And he said, well, go see. And it turns out right after the kidnapping, there had been a whole bunch of books, including Patricia's own book, but there had been nothing written on this subject for decades. So I thought, wow, there's a opening here. And is there new stuff that's come out in those decades? Or were you able to get people to talk who hadn't talked well, before? <laughs> there's not new stuff that's come out during the decades, but there is new stuff, I am confident to say, in my book. Mm-hmm. Lots of it, actually. I um, made a deal with Bill Bill Harris, who was one of the surviving members of the SLA. Um, he, was, he, he was a tremendous pack rat, and he had 150 boxes of material that he was about to sell to a university library. The deal fell through. I bought 
those documents from him, and I'm going to give them to the Harvard Law School Library, you know, af- after my book is is out. Um, and there was a lot in those documents. Personally, that had never go through come 150 out. boxes. Well, of it this. was it was actually a tremendous challenge to yeah. me. You know, I had been dealing almost exclusively with PDFs, with stuff online, and suddenly I had all this paper, and I hadn't dealt with paper for for quite some time. And I actually hired my son uh, used to play soccer in in Sherman, Connecticut, where we have a weekend house. I hired a couple of the soccer moms that I used to, you know, stand on the sideline with to make an index of the 150 boxes, and they did a incredibly meticulous. This and is fantastic a very job. good recruitment tool here. Suggestion to like hire the soccer moms to get uh, things absolutely. done. Absolutely, <laughs> these guys, the, these women were fantastic, and there was a lot of gold in those boxes. Let's talk about the Symbionese Liberation Army. I mean, what is that? Donald DeFries, who was this really somewhere between a uh, minor and a mid-level criminal Mm -hmm. uh, most of his life, was sort of radicalized in prison, but really never had any clear political ideas. He came up with this word Symbionese as a sort of corruption of symbiosis, people working together. He called them liberation. They didn't liberate anything or anyone, and he called them an army. They never really had more than about a dozen people. So the the name is triply misleading, but it is certainly has some resonance in history. I, I find that when I talk to people about this, the first thing they say is, oh, the Symbionese Liberation Army, because the name is kind of colorful. And right. Memorable. And then they feel bad because they don't know who the Symbionese are. And right. <laughs> why don't they know? <laughs> why don't they know? Why they needed to be liberated? Why don't they know? And, and actually, you know, the other thing about, uh, about it is that people think of this as some sort of like black revolutionary movement. There was exactly one black person in the SLA. It was just to freeze. The others were sort of radical hangers-on, middle-class kids, several of them from the Indiana University drama program. And though the SLA didn't really accomplish anything, they did have a sense of guerrilla theater, which was sort of in the air, even, even in Bloomington, Indiana. And that was a big part of what they did, was sort of showing off how radical they were, even if they had no coherent goals. Right. Well, the the photo of Patty Hearst as Tanya with that gun, I mean, is that post? Like, what, what is that? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that was a classic example of their guerrilla theater, um, was posing her in front of the seven-headed cobra, which was their symbol. And, and one reason I think this story still has resonance for people is that iconic photograph, the expression on Patty Hearst's face is so inscrutable. I mean, in the book, I say somewhat facetiously, but not entirely, that it was kind of a Mona Lisa for the era, because you can't quite tell. Is she proud? Is she terrified? Is she coerced? Is she a revolutionary? And that photograph, which is so emblematic of the whole story, was indicative of how much they really liked to show off which they did. And what is her version of this? What's the version that she put forth in her memoir? And has she stuck to that throughout the years? Yes. And her version that she testified about at at her trial, which was from day one, she was kidnapped, which was a terrifying, horrifying experience. But following her kidnapping, her version is she was coerced to do everything from for the next year and a half. She was coerced to rob the original bank, the, the Kybernia Bank, which is the ba- bank robbery for which she was prosecuted. A big part of the story, as far as I'm concerned, is the extraordinary numbers of crimes she committed while she was on the run. Two other bank robberies, when including one where a woman was killed, where she shot up a street in Los Angeles, set off bombs in the San Francisco area. Her version is that she was coerced to do all of that. My version is that she actually became a member of the SLA and was a voluntary participant for much of that period. And what persuaded you that that's what happened? The scope and range and number uh, of crimes she was committed, also the way she was treated. She was left alone. She had many opportunities to escape. She had many chances to uh, simply walk away. She was involved with some people during this period who encouraged her to surrender. My view was given 
um, her behavior. You know, I try to avoid the psychobabble associated with this case, brainwashing Stockholm syndrome, and focus on what she actually did. And my view is in light of what she actually did, she was a voluntary participant for most of that period. Now, F. Lee Bailey, during uh, his defense of her, the, the defense they used was uh, coercive persuasion, right? Correct. For, so what, I'm curious about the, the history of that versus brainwashing. And this was like pre-Stockholm syndrome as a notion, right? right? But had that defense existed and been used successfully? Did it have a long history? It, 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 and- did, it didn't have a long history, but it was established in law. I mean, just as, as a practical matter, think about it. You know, if, if you have a gun on you and rob a bank with, you know, under, you're under the gun, you are not guilty. And, that, and that's a long established principle in law. And that was the defense that, that she used at trial, that this was simply rob this bank or you'll be killed too. And, and so as a legal matter, it wasn't novel. But you had to prove factually that you were, in fact, coerced. That was what the whole trial was about. I mean, the, 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 what was so interesting about her trial is that the facts of the case were not in dispute. Everyone acknowledged that she was in the bank, that she held the machine gun. The whole trial was about what was in her head, what was her motivation, her, in, her, her intent. And she was convicted. Um, and sentenced to seven years in prison as a result of that case. And did she serve? Well, she served 22 months, but then Jimmy Carter gave her a commutation. And then 20 years later, Bill Clinton gave her a full pardon. So Patty Hearst to this day remains the only person in American history to receive a commutation from one president and a pardon from another. Hmm. And was that was there a lot of pressure, I assume, put on the presidents by the Hearst family? And It, it was an extraordinary demonstration of the power and privilege of the Hearst family, that they managed to recruit Ronald Reagan, who was governor of California at the time, to encourage Carter to issue a pardon. You know, the local congressman, you had the African-American community. I mean, they really mobilized a tremendous uh, lobbying campaign on, on her behalf. And there was an intervening news event that actually tipped the balance in favor of a commutation, which was another 70s insanity, the uh, mass suicide in Guyana by the Reverend Jim Jones and his followers, the People's Temple, which gave the idea of brainwashing wide airing. And that Help prompt Carter to give her. I feel like I need like a timeline of the insanities of the seventies. You well, know, <laughs> you know, it, it, and 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 I didn't realize when I started this book just how much insanity there was because you know in the middle of this whole uh, you know extravaganza when she's on the run, Richard Nixon resigns the presidency. You know, there are gas lines everywhere because of the energy crisis. I mean, the, the, the degree to which the United States was having a collective nervous breakdown during the early and mid-70s was shocking to me looking back. So you tried to talk to Patty Hearst, I obviously, did. and uh, and she said, "Did you have an email exchange? Were there phone calls? Did you go through an intermediary? <laughs> well, How did that?" Uh, all all of the above. I can describe the phone call to you. In fact, I can give you a transcript of the phone call because I had emailed several times, and finally, I just decided to call and I said, "You know, Patricia, this is Jeff Tubin. Oh God, click." So, so Let's I mean, play that now. Yeah, <laughs> there was no there was no doubt about her feelings. And look, you know. Patty Hearst is in her early 60s now. She's a mother. She's a grandmother. She has very much moved on in her, in, in her life. Um, she's very involved in raising show dogs. Um, and I have a picture of her winning Shih Tzu Rocket um, in, in, in the book. And, and, and I can understand why she doesn't want to deal with anymore. In addition, you know, on a slightly less favorable view, the more you get into the facts of this case, you know, she's given many interviews over the years, almost exclusively to reporters who don't know the facts of the case very well. Mm-hmm. There are many aspects that if you dig in, you see are not so favorable to her. And I can understand why she doesn't want to revisit those. If you had like five minutes with her right now, what would you want to ask her? About why she shut up Mel Sporting Goods. May 16th, 1974, she's sitting alone in a van across the street while two members of the SLA are are shopping in this store called Mel Sporting Goods. She's by herself in this van. The key's in the ignition. She can walk away. Bill Harris gets caught shoplifting. 
the clerk comes out on the sidewalk and tackles him. And what does Patty Hearst do alone in the car? She takes out a machine gun and shoots up this entire block in order to free Bill Harris, miraculously not hitting anyone, and successfully frees Bill Harris. Why, if you are a coerced victim, are you shooting up an entire street alone in a van to free your comrade? All right. Well, we won't get that answer here, (laughs) uh, but there are many other answers in the book. Um, The book, again, is American Heiress, The Wild Saga of the Kidnapping, Crimes, and Trial of Patty Hearst by Jeffrey Tubin. Jeff, thanks for being here. Thank you. My colleague, John Williams, and my kind of colleague also, but not at the book review, we're Wesley colleagues. Morris. We're colleagues. Wesley Morris, special guest star, here to talk about what we're reading this week. Hi, guys. Hey, bye. Uh, Wesley, you are officially culture writer at large. What's your... I think the business card said says critic at large. Critic at large. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, person I, who can write critically about anything I and everything. I feel like I have to disclaim that, though, every time I say it, because it just sounds like... It sounds like a Tammany Hall thing. I think it sounds know, pretentious. It, just, it does sound a little pretentious. It sounds right? pretentious and a little bit suspect. Like, what do you mean at large? <laughs> like, where, did you escape? Like, where are no, you not? No, this is this is the old school USA part of it. It, that it does just sound kind antiquated, of, right? I just say culture critic generally. I think that there needed to be some sort of wedge to put me in, like to give like a class of thing. We're I'm drawn not... by a critic about town, Wesley right, Morris. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Right. All right. Well, John Williams, you just did that so effectively. So tell us what you're reading, Wesley. I'm obsessed with this awakening that we appear to be having in this country around whiteness and like what it is and where it came from <laughs> and why people are suddenly interested in it. And have people always been interested in it? I'm writing a book about blackness that meets up in some interesting ways with with whiteness studies, I guess, for lack of a better for lack of a better term, which is something that fascinates me. So I'm reading the the Nancy Eisenberg book, White Trash, mm-hmm. the 400 year untold history of white people in America, or whatever. It, That's still on our bestseller list, which I find very soothing. Still, yeah, I mean, it just it just came out. It's yeah. people Things are interested move fast in this. here I mean, on the bestseller list. Well, mostly. yeah, I try to. I only look at it like six times a year because it's just too much. Like, I, I mean, this is an aside. Like, I had not looked at it. Tanahasi's book came out, you know, a year ago, a couple weeks ago. And I think I might have looked at it the week after it came out, the the book. And then I looked at it in February and it was still on the list. And it's it's always number one at my bookstore. And I'm just like, <laughs> damn it. This is crazy. Your bookstore but is you indicative. You see people reading it on the, on the subway. It's just, it's exciting. I'm excited that a book like that has the legs that it has. That's so, it's been 56 weeks. It's yeah. the longest running book currently on our nonfiction bestseller yeah. list. I'm impressed by that. There are some woke people (laughs) in this country right now. The other good thing is that I think it's a private thing for a lot of people. Like, no one comes up to me and has said, I've read uh, Between the World and Me. Would you like to discuss it? No, no, that never happens, Hmm. Uh, which is great. (laughs) (laughs) Because you don't want to talk about it. (laughs) No, I just don't. At a dinner party is one thing, but there are just some (laughs) things where, like, people just can't control. It's the the sort of intellectual equivalent of, can I touch your hair? Like... (laughs) Can I just read this Tanahasi Coates book? Can I? Can you please make me feel better about it? <laughs> and my response is probably going to be no. I cannot because y- you have to own that. But anyway, the Nancy- well, we'll own the white trash here for right. so but, tell us but, all about what you think. I, I just think this book is like as a history. It's great. Her research explains a lot of things to me that uh, I hadn't had an. I suspect it was the case, but hadn't had a real answer to, and probably would never have had an answer were it not for this book. Mostly about the the way this country was founded and and upon whom it was founded. Mm-hmm. I mean, it it was slavery. Well, Native American slavery, poor white people. The sort of tension between poor white people and black people, as dictated by what better off white people, and they weren't necessarily pitted against each other, slaves and poor white people. What bears out is like a somewhat obvious hierarchy of 
of power and powerlessness. And the, I was reading, if you read the Matthew Desmond book, the most shocking evicted. thing- Evicted. The most shocking thing in that book to me is the desperate certainty with which the poor white people in that book just know that the worst thing they can do in the most dire straits is to live in a black neighborhood. They just won't do that. They, no matter how poor they are, uh, he quotes at least three people saying something along the lines of, I would rather die than live among black people. This book, the Nancy Eisenberg book, is the history of- The Trump movement. How those people, right. I mean, well, also just, that part is really complicated, but it, 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 it you can make these connections that, that she gives you. She gives you the material to make these connections. And she's obviously, obviously aware of the moment that we're in. Right. Too. I think mm -hmm. that's why this book is in large mm -hmm. part really um, speaking to people right now. There's the J.D. Vance book, which I haven't, the Hillbilly Elegy. Yeah, I haven't gotten it yet, but I'll, I'll read that at some point too. It's really interesting too, if you contrast the books that people are reading in order to understand uh, liberalism and conservatism, mm -hmm. um, the ones that are sort of trying to understand the Trump movement, I don't even know if conservative is probably not even the right word, are this memoir, Hillbilly Elegy, um, this very serious um, uh, nonfiction book, White Trash by Nancy Eisenberg. And meanwhile, the top four bestsellers this week that are sort of the right explaining oh, yeah. the left yeah, are... Yeah. Uh, Dinesh D'Souza on Hillary's America is number one. Glenn Beck's uh, Liars is number two. Crisis of Character um, by uh, Gary Byrne and Grant M. Schmidt is number three. And Dick Morrison and Eileen McGann's Armageddon is number four. The uh, consolation in a certain way to that is that um, Hamilton, the Revolution, is number five. <laughs> yeah. Think about what that book is. Right. You well, know? And then you have Hillbilly <laughs> Elegy, but I really feel like, and then, you know, two down you have Between the World and Me. It's like people are really trying to understand what's going on right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I am one of the people trying to figure it out. I wonder if it's been the last year that has compelled people to want to do it between the police shootings, these sort of proliferation of recorded police shootings, mm -hmm. I should say, and this election cycle. I just feel like people are confused they are scared they are curious and a lot of people are certain i think that mm. i mean i don't want to no shots to the to the to the hillary's america people but i feel like if you're reading dinesh d'souza you just want some reinforcement yes, yes <laughs> right. you aren't trying to figure anything out you want confirmation right you just you want to you want to you want to read you want to look into a mirror for 346 pages or however long that book is. All right. Well, John, you're looking into a mirror <laughs> in your reading <laughs> well, in a very different way. We'll get to Tell my, we'll get to my mirror looking. in a minute. We'll, we'll, we'll start less self-reflectively, self thank God. Um, I actually want to talk Although this Although the book is called Look at Me. Well, that's true. The non-self-reflective one is called Look at Me. So I get it in somehow in every book I read. Um, I want to talk about appreciation for knowing people who recommend great books because this week I'm rec recommending two things very highly okay. and I would not have read them if it weren't for friends of mine who recommended them. So the first book is a novel by Anita Bruckner called Look at Me and uh, my friend Andy Miller who's a very funny and insightful British writer um, and very active on Twitter started tweeting paragraphs from this book a couple mm. of weeks ago and I'd never read Bruckner so I read actually earlier this week her first book which was called published in the US as The Debut appropriately enough and she published it when she was in her 50s and that was very good and I would recommend it but Look at Me is on another level I mean this is the kind of book where if you aspire to write on just about every page there's something that both inspires you to go to the desk and try but also makes you think why bother mm. because it's just so rich and what I a hate lovely that combination yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. you're sort of torn I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing paralysis is good with writing paralysis can be good it can be productive if you somehow <laughs> break out of it eventually yeah. yeah it's just about it's a very simple story uh, as I think most of her books are about a woman who a sort of lonely librarian who befriends this glamorous couple and then falls in love with a friend of theirs and it's really just about being inside her brain and her impressions of these people and of herself and a lot about what it means to be a writer because the character also wants to write so um 
Look at Me by Anita Bruckner, I would very highly recommend. The second book is very different. It was recommended to me many years ago by um, a good friend of mine who works at The Times named Jamie Ryerson, who writes our Ivory Tower column in the book review Mm -hmm. and is on a very, very short list of the smartest people I've ever met. So when he wrote for me when I was running a books website about this book, um, I bought a copy. This was about six years ago. It's been sitting on my shelf ever since. It's called Should You Leave? It's by the psychologist uh, Peter Kramer, who everyone Just knows wrote a book. Right. for listening to Prozac and who has a new book out also about antidepressants. The subtitle of this book is A Psychiatrist Explores Intimacy and Autonomy and the Nature of Advice. And Ooh. Jamie and I were joking about the fact that you know I'm currently single, and so it seems like maybe a weird time to be reading this book. But Jamie pointed out that you can't really read this book while you're in a relationship because you can't have it laying around on the night table. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, yeah. right. Should yeah. you leave, yeah. you know, covering your face at night. Um, <laughs> but the fact is, the reason I picked it up is because Jamie very convincingly talked about it as a book that really w- was about that question, but was really about overall the nature of human needs and psychology and the nature of psychoanalysis and also the nature of giving advice to people and whether you can be an expert in that or not. And it's all these sort of imaginary case studies that he writes about in the second person. He says things like, you walk into my office and you've been having trouble with your marriage. And he's such a lucid writer in general, I think. And in this book, he really just gets at a lot of different issues. It moves among a lot of different subjects very lightly from Freud to Kierkegaard to a lot of sort of mid-century psychologists that we have forgotten, but who were very influential at the time. And, you know, we only really talk about Freud now. Um, And it also just talks about the different ways that we adjust to social norms, the way that we adjust to other people, what we expect from them, um, the ways that we sort of perform for them. And just overall, I think there's there's really something to learn on every page, pretty much. It's almost entertaining in a weird way. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel, you know, heavy or, you know, it doesn't make you doubt things. It kind of makes things feel clearer momentarily while you're reading it. So I would highly recommend it. This is the second week in a row. You've mem- you've recommended books about reading about other people's problems. Um, and uh, in both cases, it's sort of weirdly entertaining. Well, I think that if you can do that, that's kind of the best of both worlds. I yeah. mean, if you can learn something about yourself, as he says in this book, you know, wisdom is not the goal, it's growth. And I think if you can learn something and also um, feel like you're in good company at the same time, that's pretty great. I made a, a vow to myself earlier this year to read more psychology and philosophy just on sort of a whim. And I think as, a, as the year goes on, I realize that there was something subconscious happening. Like I'm 42 years old and I'm at a certain point in life and I do feel like I'm kind of wrestling with some of these larger issues. Well, last week you gave me a copy of the book that you recommended. Yeah, The Examined Life by Stephen Gross. So I'm just I'm going to just keep following John Williams's. Uh, um, yeah, I'm definitely here. I'm going to get that. I think you'd <laughs> love this book. This is a great book. I'm going to hide it whenever anybody. I mean, <laughs> nobody's coming over. <laughs> if just, someone comes just, over for dinner, just just, just in case somebody does come over. Put the Anita Bruckner on top. (laughs) So Pamela, I'm sure you haven't gotten to the examined life quite yet. So what are you reading this week? Well, I feel uh, incredibly superficial next to both of you because I've been uh, mostly watching TV this week. Um, I've been continuing my Veep marathon. Um, we're now in season four. So I feel this like is great. I'm jealous of you that you get to rewatch this. It is a great show and very, very well written. So I'm a little behind on my reading. I did finish the Colson Whitehead. Um, and I am currently, uh, for those tracking my ongoing Hamilton, uh, the Ron Chernow biography project, I am only at the revolution. <laughs> um, and so those of you who have read this know that that is a very sad showing indeed. <laughs> you have a long way to go. I've got a long oh, way to go. Wow. Julia Louis-Dreyfus is distracting you. I'll make progress by next week. I've never read it, though. It is worth reading okay the first sort of sentence of the very first song is about 50 pages in the book Mm -hmm. and uh (laughs) and i find that part particularly interesting it's about uh caribbean history um and my working knowledge of caribbean history is basically you know like the pirates of the caribbean uh Mm -hmm. movie series so uh so this round (laughs) filled in some of those gaps very nicely (laughs) those chasms yes clarified certain things wait where's jack sparrow that's right he's not in any part of his book (laughs) you learn so much when you read. (laughs) I quit you, Ron Chernow. (laughs) All right. Wesley Morris, John Williams, thank you so much. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks for having me. Remember, there's more at nytimes.com slash books. Our producer is Jocelyn Gonzalez, and you can always write to us at books at nytimes.com. Thanks for listening. For The New York Times, I'm Pamela Paul.